worship service. And we would like to open up in the time of prayer. This is a season of prayer, amen? The Bible says men should always pray and not to faint. And these days we need prayer more than ever, don't we? So let's gather together in prayer and go before the throne of grace. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, so much for the privilege, for the provision of prayer. We thank you, Lord, that the way to the throne of grace has been opened by none other than our Lord Jesus Christ through the veil, his flesh. And we just thank you, Lord God, that as he has gave himself as the only and all-sufficient sacrifice for our sins, that we can come with confidence in his shed blood, in his sacrifice, and come to a holy God and just be able to make our request known unto you. We are thankful this morning. We are grateful for that access and Lord, in these days, Lord, where the pressure is increasing, Lord, you also pour on our strength. He says, as our days are, so shall our strength be. And if, we're, if we faint in a time of adversity, our strength is small. But Lord, you invite us to be strong in the Lord and in the power of your might. And we thank you, Lord, that we're reminded of the eagle's promise of Isaiah, that, Lord, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, and they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Father, we thank you, Lord, that in this day we are being strengthened because of your grace, because of your mercy. We pray, Father, for those in our local assembly, Lord, that are suffering physically. We pray, Lord, that you would touch them today. We pray, Father, for the, this, the wars that are going on and the tremendous upheaval, Lord, that are, is going on throughout the whole world, Lord. And we know that these times were told that these, these things were happen, that it is the birth pangs that, that was prophesied years ago. And we're experiencing it and we're seeing more and more of these things happen. But Father, we pray, dear Lord, for your people throughout this globe. We pray for preachers of the gospel. Pray that they will be more emboldened and strong in the in the in the uh, rightly dividing of the word of truth. We pray that they will be able to stand in these evil days uh, uh, and to withstand against the enemy. We father we pray, Father, for those are going through financial difficulties with the rising prices that we're seeing all over the place. And we pray, dear Lord, that men will not run to governments for the help, but that we will look to the Lord from with cometh our help. And we pray, dear Father, that as things become more and more difficult, that your people will gather together more often, that we will study and pray more often together, that we will encourage each other more often as we see the day approaching. Father God, we pray also that to today's message, Lord, that our ears will be wide open, our hearts will be wide open. We're asking, Lord, that you would speak it's not the word of a man. It's not the opinion of some brainy person. But 
for this is the eternal word of God that you gave. And Father, we pray, dear Lord, that we will receive it in the humility, in the meekness that you give, that the Spirit of God is producing in our hearts, that we will have a, a, a that we will give our hearts to. He says, my son, give me thine heart. And Lord God, we desire that you would have our heart, our attention, our lives are in your hands. We ask that you would bless, Lord, this time together. And we ask we observe, Lord, the, and remember that the finished work through the communion service today. We pray, dear Lord, that you would make it very special with your presence, that you would just um, bind us together more and help us, Lord God, with these days that we're facing. We also pray, Lord, for those who are traveling. We thank God for um, uh, uh, the uh, Brysons who are their newborn. Father, we just thank you for them and their uh, firstborn child. Father, we thank you for them. We, we pray for our children in our ministry and um, we just pray for all of them. Just think about them and pray that you protect them and that you would keep them well and then help them to develop. We also pray, Lord, uh, for the Mayo family. A lot of people here may not know them. They're Christians. But Father God, we pray for them. They're one of their dear uh, sons uh, uh, is missing right now, Father. So we pray, dear Lord, that you will be found. Um, we pray, dear, somehow, Lord, that you protect his life and that you would just intervene into this, this situation for them, Lord God. We just pray, Lord, that you would be very merciful to them and, and help them, Lord God, to recover this, this young man who's a college student. We pray, Father, for this city as we go about our daily business as believers, Lord. The things are so dangerous and so, um, so dangerous. We pray, dear Father, your protection around each of all of our families and our friends. We're asking, Lord, that you would, in your providential way, that you would protect us in these days. And Lord, that we will not fear what man should do unto us, but that we will have boldness and confidence in the precious name of Jesus, we pray. We pray, dear Lord, that um, that as the, the, in these last days, Lord, as the word goes out, Lord, that men will hear it, will hear the call of the Spirit uh, to be saved, first of all, and then also, Lord, that they would hear the call to follow you and fall in love with you and to get to know you through the Bible. We pray, Father, for even some Bible colleges to be raised up right here in, in Owens Mills, Lord. We're praying, Lord, that somehow that you would bring this together so that we'll have uh, some students that will be serious about getting to know God through the Bible together. Lord, that would happen here, Father. We pray, Father, for our music ministry. We pray, Father, for our children's ministry. We pray for our outreaches. We pray, Father, for our prayer meetings. We pray, Father, for every aspect of this church, Lord. We lift it up to you and ask that you continue to show us the way. It's not in us, Lord, to direct our own way. We are dependent on you and Lord God we we we, uh, we, for, we would desire to forsake our own way our own thoughts for yours and we ask that you would just fill us with your wisdom fill us with your direction and give us um, strength in these days and we just ask that you will uh, thank you Lord for this and uh, we pray for um, the 
the our elderly as well. Um, we pray for Uncle William who's recovering in the hospital, my wife's uncle. And uh, we pray also for uh, Dr. Lisa. We also pray for uh, Charlene Mitchell. We pray, Father, for um, Joy, um, also, Lord, who's waiting for a kidney. We pray, dear Lord, for all these precious people, Lord, that are in need right now. And we remember them in prayer. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Praise God. So, uh, praise the Lord. All right. Yeah, this is, uh, okay. All right. So, praise God. One second. <laughs> we're ready for communion. Amen. <clears throat> Praise God. So this is a time where we can prepare ourselves for our communion. Would you pass out the crackers and juice? It's good to see everybody. Be able to uh, have this time together is, is really precious. Praise God. Let's just bow our heads and prepare our hearts for communion. Lord's, Lord's will. believer in Jesus Christ um, and in fellowship with him um, you are welcome to partake if you're not a, if you're not a believer you can you can become a believer right now just you can pray this prayer say Lord I'm a sinner and I ask dear Lord that I believe in you and I believe that Jesus is your son I believe that he died for me, for my sins, and that's all I need to trust you for eternal life. And we thank you for, I thank you for the gift of eternal life. So if you pray that prayer, um, that's all, that's all it is. You receive Jesus Christ by faith and you are welcome to partake of the communion with us. You just need to be part of the family. And that's, it's just a, Believing the finished work of Jesus Christ. Praise God. <clears throat> All right. Okay. Since the fall, since the fall of humanity into the darkness of sin, Man has always looked for peace. And peace only comes from one direction, and it comes from God. He's the God of all peace. But man tries to produce his own peace, but it's never, never uh, he's sufficient. So Isaiah 57, verse 20, as we prepare for communion, says but the wicked the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest and you think about our world think about this as we read this scripture the wicked are like a troubled sea when it cannot rest whose waters are cast up mire and dirt and then it says in verse 21, there is no peace, saith my God, 
for the wicked. There is no peace for the wicked. Then verse 19 says, I create, God says, I create the fruit of the lips. What does this mean? In Hosea, we read 14 verse 2, it says, take with you words, turn to the Lord, say unto him, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously, so will we render the calves of our lips. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, it says, by him, Jesus Christ, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise. So what is the fruit of the lips? It's a sacrifice of praise to God continually, it says, that the fruit of our lips is the giving of thanks to his name. Then verse 19 of Isaiah 57 says, peace, peace to him that is afar off, that is all the Gentile nations, and to him that is near, that is to Israel, Israel Jew, the Jewish nation. Peace, peace, he says. And then he says, I will heal Gentile Jew. Acts chapter 2, verse 39, the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost said this, For the promise is for you and to your children, Israel, and to all that are far off, that's the Gentiles, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. The promise of the Holy Spirit is for you. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 17 says, And came and preached peace to you which are afar off, and to them that are nigh. And as we prepare for this communion, Jew and Gentile alike, as we trust in him, have called upon his name, how does he do it? How does he give us who are all of us are wicked. All of us have fallen short. There's none of us righteous. No, not one. But the righteous one has created the fruit of the lips. He has created something for all of us to partake. How does that happen? That we can receive from a holy God the peace that this world so needs there's only one way and it's found in Isaiah chapter 32 verse 17 Isaiah 32 17 says this says this and the work of righteousness that's Jesus Christ shall be peace and the effect of righteousness quietness and assurance forever the Lord Jesus Christ has done a work and in John 1930 it says it is finished and that work gives us peace and quietness and assurance forever. So as you take the, as we remember the bread which is a symbol of his precious body, Jesus Christ, and him alone. He says, a body hast thou prepared for me to sacrifice for all mankind, to taste death for all mankind, Jew and Gentile alike. His body, he sacrificed, and he says, he gave himself on Calvary. So would you take the bread and eat it? And then the cup. 
represents his, his shed blood. That he poured out willingly. And it says this for our forgiveness. This is without the shedding blood, innocent blood, innocent, sinless blood. There is no forgiveness for sins. So Jesus Christ willingly allowed himself to go through the sufferings of the cross to shed his blood for all of us. So as we remember him and his ultimate sacrifice, we are redeemed. We are set free from the wages of sin and death. We have eternal life because of his sacrifice of his blood on Calvary. That now is on the mercy seat. That speaks better things than the blood of Abel. As it says, you're forgiven. It says, justificate, you're justified. My righteousness is now your righteousness. We have peace with God. We have union with God and with one another all over the world. Would you drink together? Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity just to share together just a few moments of remembering the finished work, remembering what you did on Calvary and what that means to us today, Father. We ask that you bless now as we prepare for the message. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Um, can we uh, all stand and turn to um, Isaiah 65, 17? For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former, sh the former shall not be remembered, nor crime into the, nor come into the mind. Um, let's also turn to uh, Ephesians three twenty. Now, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Um, that's it. Amen. Um, let's all pray for the uh, for our hearts and the message and the speaker. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. It's exciting. Anybody not quite sure that this is the day the Lord has made? Because <laughs> it is. He made this. This is his day. And um, he has a special plan for us for this day. Yes. So, um, yeah, Pastor Ronaldo, isn't it amazing to be under a pastor who seeks the kingdom of God? Amen. We spoke on last week. We're continuing on this week. The kingdom of God. Um, God's kingdom. 
And we made a distinction last week between uh, earthly kingdom and heavenly kingdom. And the earthly kingdom is amazing. The coming kingdom, we're all praying for it. Thy kingdom come. It's an amazing thing. There will be a time when Jesus Christ is King and Lord of this planet. It's going to reign for a thousand years. It's a real kingdom, a physical kingdom. And we should all be looking forward to that. So those of us in the church will be glorified saints, providing the government, providing the judiciary, providing the facilitation, and just providing the government. Imagine a godly government. No one could possibly imagine that. Remember what he just read? Beyond anything we can think or imagine. No one can ever put that one together. Godly government. Um, the question we have when we're dealing with outreach, soul winning, and just talking to people who have real problems and real issues with the real world right here and now. You've heard the phrase, so heavenly minded, no, earth, no earthly good. I tend to reject that phrase because if you really are heavenly minded, you'll have be focus on the things of God, which are people, which are souls, which will make you earthly good. Yes, yes, yes. So I think that phrase applies to people who have their head in the clouds and they just think they're better than everybody else. Yeah. And they can quote some Bible verses and they can know they know more Bible than you do and they're really useless. So, but let's not get caught in that trap. It's like, when you really have the mind of Christ, that's the only earthly good you'll ever be. You can't provide earthly good without the gospel. You can't provide counseling without the cross. Let that sentence think in. You can't help somebody in their personal problems without the cross because their personal problems are based in the flesh in the world system, and the cross is what provides deliverance. So you provide a solution that makes someone feel good without the cross. I remember a friend of mine in college, her, her father was a psychiatrist, and um, she had just gotten saved, and so she had some questions. My father helps so many people, and back then I didn't have the tact and care that I have today, and I said, well, he helps people feel more comfortable, comfortable before they go to hell. Um, not the right thing to say, but it is pointed. It's like, oh yeah, you helped a person. You gave them a worldly solution. And you stopped their need, you, you, their need for seeking God. A good friend of mine in college, a uh, serious heroin addict. And I spent a lot of time presenting the gospel to her. And she was really on the verge she was everything looked right and all of a sudden her family came down kidnapped her and put her into a rehab center mm -hmm. she got healed of heroin but she had no need for god after that so did they do her any favors uh, you know you hear what i'm saying the question is on this world is the earthly kingdom all that there is we know there's a heavenly kingdom it's beyond the earthly kingdom uh, a few years ago i was speaking to a jehovah witness and they were explaining the benefits of becoming a Jehovah Witness, Jehovah's Witness. And um, they say, you know, the chance of being one of the 144,000 is pretty slim to none, but if you do all the right things and get your numbers in and whatever criteria they have, someday, you know, um, you'll be resurrected again in a new life on a brand new paradise that this planet will become someday. And they're speaking of the kingdom a little bit, right? And I said, so let me get this right. If I do everything just right, there's a chance that a copy of me might be stuck on this planet forever. I said, that's not good enough for me. You know, I am not going to be in this world forever. It's not my home. It never will be my home. But the natural mind cannot conceive of a heavenly kingdom. I don't care what you are, a mystic, a new ager, an incredible science fiction author, everything is contained in this universe, other universes, but it's still earthly. A universe where righteousness it prevails, where there's no curse, immortality, and eternity, it's outside the frame of mind. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, One, he has made everything beautiful in its time. creation 
Everything's beautiful, but also he has put eternity into man's heart so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. This is the human dilemma. My creation looks good. All I know is what I see in here, but there's something missing. When Brother Miles read Isaiah 65, 17, Behold, I'm creating new heavens and a new earth. How many people were surprised to find that in the Old Testament? Wait a minute. Old Testament's about earthly kingdom. But this is the kingdom of heaven. A lot of rabbis talk about, well, things like heaven and Satan and that. That's all Christian stuff. We deal with practical things. And um, I don't tell them that Satan and God spoke in the book of Job in their Bible. New heavens and a new earth. The form of things will not be remembered or come to mind. Everybody go back and think about that one afternoon when you were three and your favorite toy got broke or lost and your world was over. Everybody remember that? I guarantee it happened. But did it, does it come to mind often? Has it scarred you for life? Right. Those are former things. Things that just don't process now in our, in our adult life. And let's just realize that you will, there will be the same jump in the new, new heavens and new earth. New heavens and new earth. Martin Luther said the greatest theologian understands the love of God as well as a newborn baby understands this world. He had no idea what's really out there, what's in it for us. Remember, be God what you can think or imagine is also he, he said. So, the kingdom. Again, from last week, Jesus said my kingdom is not of this world. Right? He also said the kingdom of God is among you. King James says within you. That's been abused a lot. Among you. In other words, Jesus was saying, I'm among you. So, a theme for today is the kingdom of heaven and Jesus are one and the same. Jesus is the kingdom of heaven. Okay? Everything he has to offer us is part of that kingdom. And um, he said, <clears throat> if the kingdom of heaven is among you, how do we seek the kingdom? We'll just do some simple algebra there. We seek Jesus. We seek the one whom the Father has sent. Let's turn to John 14. So, the question can often be asked, well, we have an earthly kingdom, as promised us, but this spiritual kingdom, this heaven, is it like really real? Is it just some sort of esoteric thought process? Is it some sort of ascended ethereal life? John 14, Jesus says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Verse 2, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Sound like a real place to me? Sounds like a real place to you? That's about as real as it gets. This is part of the Jewish marriage cultural system. Father finds a bride for the son. Whatever arrangements are made there. We see this example with Abraham sending a servant to find a bride for Isaac. Once the arrangements are made, there the betrothal happens, and a betrothal is one notch above a engagement and one notch below a marriage. Betrothal requires a divorce to break, so it's very serious. So the betrothed, the wife at that point, the bride-to-be, then goes back home. Her husband goes back to his father's house or goes back to a place to prepare their new home. And her job is to wait. Her job, she doesn't know. Her, her husband-to-be, you know, the, that she's betrothed to, it's going to show up next week or next month or next year or five years. Sure, she lives her life, does everything she can to be ready, and that's what the church is doing right now. 
you went to make a place for us. Uh, the fun quip is he made the entire universe in six days, so he's had 2,000 years to work on your mansions. Should be pretty nice, okay? So, a real place. Now, we talked about last week, my kingdom come. This is the first request in the Lord's Prayer. But it's maybe followed by thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And this is our foundation for prayer. God's will. Your will be done. Any question that God's will is always done in heaven? It's perfect, right? God's will and heaven are synonymous. Here on earth, not so much. Here on earth, this permissive will, God allows 7 billion free wills to act crazy and everything happens based on how much we tell God to help us or tell God to get lost. And we see the state of the planet. And But when we pray, we are invoking this. We're saying, God, I need this little pocket of chaos to have your will imposed upon it. Dear God, your will, which is perfect in heaven, always happens in heaven, will someday be here on the earth. And please, God, fix this situation, heal this person. We had a beautiful time of prayer earlier today, and that's what we're doing. God, you're the creator. Please use your creative powers to bring your perfect will into this situation on earth right now. But this also lets, lets us know that heaven's a real place. Turn to Matthew 13. Since the kingdom of heaven we're discussing right now is synonymous with Jesus Christ himself, I, I would say that seeking the kingdom of heaven is seeking Jesus. And seeking Jesus is seeking his character and nature. And of course our primary admonition as Christians right now is that we be conformed to his character and nature. Being conformed to Christ, right? Romans 8, 29. For whom he foreknew us, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. You and I are guaranteed to be conformed to his image. Sooner or later, but it will happen. There are Christians that have rejected that outright. They have no interest in being conformed to his nature. And when they get to heaven, they'll have the, the shock treatment that we talked about last week. Culture shock. Oh, this is what it's like to think like Christ. Um, those of us that are working to think like him now are seeking the kingdom. And when you seek the kingdom, all of a sudden, people come first. Pastor Ronaldo seeks the kingdom. And what is he doing? Missions. Preaching. Just, it flows from that based on seeking Christ. So, Matthew 13, 44. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which when a man has found, he hides. And for the joy thereof goes and sells all he, that he has and buys the field. So, you're out working in a field. The farmer or landowner owns the field. But you're doing work in there, and you suddenly find this huge treasure. I just go ahead and imagine it, a big treasure chest. And you're cultivating the field, and your plow hits some metal, and you dig, and you go, oh my gosh, there's a big treasure here. So if you're honest, you tell the master, and say, no treasure in your field. Because who does it belong to? The master. So, but this person says, no found this treasure and he hides it again he puts it back in there he says I know it's there no one else knows it's there he sells all that he has he gives everything he has to do what to buy the field okay is he really after the field okay going after the land is one thing the book of Joshua we have God restoring the Hebrew people to their legitimate land. Mm -hmm. He says, this land is yours. I gave it to Abraham. Wherever he touched is his. It's time to remove those squatters, get them out of the way, and clear the place for the land. Mm -hmm. So, was the land the issue? Angel of the Lord fought in Jericho. God fought with them. But it was the treasure, right? 
in the bigger picture we have in the book of Revelation. The Lamb receives a title deed to the planet. This is, it. This is yours. It's been bought back. You paid everything you have. You gave your life for the land, for the planet, right? Mm -hmm. And everything but Revelation is reclaiming that planet, mm -hmm. purging the wickedness, setting up the kingdom. And was the planet really the main deal, though? Was that the whole point? It was the treasure. It was the people. It was the souls. So when the kingdom of God is like this, and if Jesus is our example for the kingdom of heaven, then we realize that if we're seeking the kingdom of heaven, we are going after the souls, not the people. Souls, not the land. Everybody heard that? checking um so yeah we take the land we kick owings mills we go out we're interested in areas and regions pastor Melba's in uh, marlboro um massachusetts. massachusetts today you know out there sowing seed taking the land is the land the issue no the souls the treasure the people and to drill down into this Again, verse 45, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he has found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Kingdom of heaven. Jesus is like this. He's seeking pearls. And just like the previous parable was land, that he paid the ultimate price to get the treasure, here, this is the individual. Okay? The treasure, the people of the world. He's seeking pearls, seeking individuals, and he finds one person, one pearl. This is the individual. And what does Jesus do for that one pearl, for that one? It's not a direct comparison, the lost lamb. That's someone's already saved. But this pearl, he sold all that he had. What did Jesus do on the cross? He gave it all. Again, outside the cross, this doesn't make sense. But when you realize the amazing love of God, that he, in building his kingdom, pays whatever the price is to get that one pearl. Yes, he would have come down to earth, been born in a manger, lived a life of ridicule and scorn, and went to the cross if only one person had accepted him. So it is fair to say he did it for you personally. And you are expected to accept that and take it personally as well. Jesus is the kingdom. The kingdom of God is among you. To seek the kingdom is to become more like him. So we make contrast between earthly and heavenly kingdom. Earthly kingdom is a search for power. If you don't understand the kingdom of heaven or you are not interested or it doesn't, it doesn't speak to you because you're not listening to God's Holy Spirit, you will be tempted to do what the rest of the world does and build your kingdom. And building kingdoms are not necessarily wrong, but we're supposed to seek first the kingdom of God. So earthly kingdoms, what do they involve? Success, right? Growth, power. Influence. There's so many kids today, their goal in life is to be an influencer. Because some online social organization made that title and they think it's a goal. And influencing is good. When you're building an earthly kingdom, we do all the right things for growth and success. And there is a wealth message in the Bible. There is a prosperity message in the Bible. You go through Deuteronomy 28 and those areas. God is the one that gives power to create wealth. It's very real. And many churches preach it without balancing it out. But the, the wealth principle there is God is the one that has the power to do that. And there's principles for that. There are biblical principles. Growth, success, um, wealth. As Christians, we do not begrudge anybody those things. Let's face it, it's the world that hates the rich, okay? We do not want to be part of that bandwagon, okay? Everyone has their lot in life, 
and there are people who have chosen to build their kingdom here and get the rewards now, and that is their business. Okay, we'll talk about it a little bit. But I like to point out that these principles do not necessarily make one biblical. You may have heard the name of Dale Carnegie, a big famous industrialist. If you ever started looking into self-help books or build yourself up books, he's the one, the famous book was How to Win Friends and Influence People, I think it was. And he studied the Bible constantly. He was a devout atheist. He was a social Darwinist. But he studied the Bible because the Bible lets you know how to treat people, how to build them up, how to get good businesses, how to get good productivity. So, yeah, he was, he was a Bible student building his earthly kingdom. Okay? They work. The church is full of ministries that give you principles and formulas that work. They don't, they don't necessarily make you Christ-like. So seeking the, God's heavenly kingdom mm -hmm. means getting to know Jesus. And there's, a, there's one of the, my issues with a lot of American Christianity is here's some Bible verses that you can use to get God to give you what you want. Balaam in the Bible. Strange character, but if you really study him, he's a godly man. He knew God. He'd been given a gift by God. He spoke with God. He called God by, with the name Yahweh, which is a covenantal name. Not just he was talking about a generic God someplace. But he was building a kingdom. And God honored him. God's gifts are without repentance. Um, he kept, caught him, made sure he did everything the way he had to do. But he never got a renewed heart. His heart was still earthly, and eventually it cost him very, very dearly. And of course, the New Testament talks about him in very negative terms, errors and curses and evil doctrines. Philippians 1, 15 through 18. Don't turn there, but there's a little section where Paul is talking about how other people are persecuting him. And those other people are other pastors. Other preachers of the gospel. He says, people are preaching the gospel, but they're doing it to hurt me. They're preaching the gospel, but they're doing it to cut me down. They're preaching the gospel to try to compete with me. They're preaching the gospel for personal gain. They're trying to get rich. They're preaching the gospel. And what is Paul's conclusion at the end of that section? It's, I don't care. He says, as long as the gospel is being preached, what do I care whether they're trying to hurt me or they're trying to make personal gain out of it? It's not my business, as long as the gospel is being preached. And we can see that all over the world. Where we should have an issue is if the gospel is not being preached. Okay, there's a famous evangelist, a name that you would know, and I don't, I don't know who it is myself. If I did know the name, I wouldn't tell you. But if you want her to come speak your organization, you must put up $20,000 right up front. You must pay for whatever jet fuel will be needed in her jet to get her there and back. You must rent out an entire floor of a five-star hotel for her and her staff. You must provide very complex, detailed um, dietary requirements, food, everything paid for. That's if you want her to speak at your organization. She's building a kingdom. And I can't begrudge it. We don't have any business judging people like that. They do their thing. You always hear on the news this, this pastor is a multimillionaire and he has this huge estate and look at all this groundskeeping and this and that. And I was like, he's got millions of dollars, fine. He is employing lots and lots of people. Glad to hear it. We do not jump on that bandwagon. But we can feel sorry. And we also have to realize that in some cases, did they ever even know God? Because there will be people that look at God and say, I did all these things for you, and he'll say, I didn't know you. So building a kingdom. Remember, Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God. We put God's kingdom first. So, 
if we find ourselves saying, okay, I've seen people build earthly kingdoms, and maybe they're godly, and maybe God is the one that's blessing that kingdom. It's not for me to say. We might ask ourselves, well, which one do I want to be part of? Earthly kingdoms can be pretty nice. From what I hear, anyway. I've never personally <laughs> experienced one. Um, but we have this, the benefits. So here's where it gets a little rough. What are the benefits of seeking God's kingdom? What are the benefits here on earth? Well, 2 Timothy 3, 11, 12 says persecution. Hmm. You seek the kingdom of God, the world's going to persecute you. In John 16, but Jesus says, you seek my kingdom, you're going to get suffering. This is where the, the rubber hits the road, pedal hits the, yeah. Um, because when we focus on God's heavenly kingdom, we're going to be paying sacrifices. But once again, the kingdom of heaven is Jesus. He's our example. When Jesus was building his kingdom, did he make a few sacrifices? Why? For the joy set before him. You know what? I can go ahead and go to that slum planet for a few years, be treated horribly, learn what it's like to really be a human being, and ultimately find out what it's like to be separated from God the Father in the most ultimate agony of all time. The biggest shock to his system. Why have you forsaken me? If it means some of us get to come with him to heaven. The joy set before him. We're promised hatred. John 15, 18, 25. The world's going to hate you. Why? Well, it hated Jesus. And if you're seeking Jesus, pretty soon you're going to get the same arrows that were meant for him. The world's going to hate you because they see Christ in you. And the more you love, the more they hate you. Paul said that himself. The nicer I am to you, the more you get mad at me. And we see that uh, in children sometimes you see that. In, in the nation of Israel, in, the, in numbers, with all the wandering and things like that, at some point it becomes clear that God has a, a recipe for sin. Punishment, plagues, you know, death, you know get sick of quail but there's no real punishment for ingratitude there's no way you can correct it and so we're dealing with, with children or people that don't appreciate you you can't punish that because they're, they're clueless right and God has to deal with the same with us sometimes ingratitude um, seeking the kingdom of God means we give up our rights we go ahead and be meek and let people step all over us sometimes you know? Remember, meek means you let them. You didn't have to. Meek means you have the rights, but you just choose not to use them. It's not weakness. It takes a lot of strength. It takes a supernatural power to be meek. We have to let God avenge us if we're seeking the kingdom of heaven. We can't <coughs> avenge our own issues. We can't fight back. If we're seeking the kingdom of God, we have to forgive We're really seeking the kingdom of God and putting it first. We're praying for our enemies. Yeah, the guy that slapped you. Yeah. Oh, he must be really hurting to do that. God, will you please help him? You know, this is crazy talk. But, let's go back to Ephesians 3.20. It's the second verse that brother read now unto him this is about praising Jesus Christ praising our God unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us and there was the common there unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages world without end Yay, world without end. 
We're not dealing with a thousand years on this earth and then we're done. We're not stuck here in time. We're not stuck here on this planet for all the ages, world without end. Now, I always like focusing on this above all that we can ask or think. What this means is more than you can imagine. Okay? Now, this verse here, verse 7, um, yeah, verse 20, is built from Isaiah 64, 4, promising that God can do more than what you can think or hear or see. What he adds to here is imagine. And I think, I take this as a, as a personal challenge, okay? If God has promised to go bigger than what I can imagine, I want to imagine as big as I can. Okay? Let's go for it. What's God have in store for me? Well, I can imagine pretty big. And God promised to beat it. Okay, God, I think you can do this. Beat that. No, I'm not telling God what to do. But in our, in our expectations, it goes far beyond what we can think or imagine. So, if what I can imagine is the baseline, and God's promised to go way beyond that, let's go see what that baseline is. Revelation 21. You all know we're going to end up in Revelation eventually. Revelation 21, this is the continuation of our verse from Isaiah, from the very first verse here. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. First heaven and first earth were passed away. There was no more sea. This is what it means to be heavenly minded. I can put up with a little bit of hatred and sorrow and discouragement and suffering. and You know, I can put up with that. That's nothing, because what God has for me, what God has for you, is beyond what you can imagine. Again, let's go back in further time. In further in time, when you're a brand newborn baby, remember what you're thinking then? The answer is no. Were you aware of all the details of this planet and this world here, politics and who's in charge? And no, I had no clue about that. We have no clue of the kingdom that's coming. We have no clue about heaven. John, in his best attempt, tried to scratch out a few things that he could with his limited human language. But this is nothing. No more sea. Literal sea, maybe. If not, the sea throughout the Old Testament was always the source of evil, the source of wicked kingdoms, the source of demons. Gone. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. The new, just like the kingdom of heaven and the king of heaven is synonymous with Jesus, the New Jerusalem is synonymous with the church. The new Jerusalem is the church. This is the abode. This is the mansion that Jesus is building right now. This is the, uh, the church's heavenly condo. But it's more than that because it's also going to be the temple. Of course, that's where, in this dispensation, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The New, New, the New Jerusalem is going to be that temple. We're part of that. And it says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, The tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. This is God's ultimate goal for the human race. He had a tabernacle in the wilderness that pointed to the one in heaven. There was a temple, again, pointing to the one in heaven. Right now, the temple is in our hearts. In the millennial reign, the temple will be rebuilt as a memorial, but it's all pointing to the real one in heaven. And the real one in heaven now is finally God and man, humans living together as one in a brand new heaven and new earth and the new earth, and the new heavens and earth. What that means is a brand new universe. Heaven's still heaven, new heavens. So we have a brand new universe. It's like when you, if you, if and when you're raptured, or when you get your brand new body, you have a glorified body. Your physical body becomes glorified. Corruptible becomes incorruptible. At some point, the same thing happens with the entire universe. We have a glorified universe. One based on eternity, not temporality. 
one based on permanence, not cause and effect and decay. One that is so eternal and so perfect, it is compatible with heaven, heaven, and they become one and the same. At which point, we dwell with God, and instead of God tabernacling on earth in a fleshly body like he did, we are now tabernacling with him in heaven. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, there shall be no more death, sorrow, crying, no more pain. Former things are passed away. This first former thing, and I like it because the original means first things. The first things. So, in a sense, and this gives us our big picture, in a sense, all of creation, all of human history, all of the different activities in God coming to earth, the salvation, the cross, new heaven, the new heavens, I mean the, the millennial reign, all of that, the 7,000 years worth of God slowly exposing himself to us, revealing himself to us, that was the first thing. The first thing, that's over. Now, we got, now we're going to the second thing, and the third thing, and the 50th thing, and the millionth thing. Who knows? You cannot imagine. Imagine big, everybody, because God's going to beat it. Wipe away former tears. Remember those tears you shed when your toy broke at the age of two? No, you don't. They've been wiped away, right? You know, everything's gone. And he that sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, unto John, write, for these words are true and faithful. Because John was looking around, and his mouth was open, he stopped writing. He said, Come on, get busy. you got a job to do. He said to me, I, it is done. This is the same word as on the cross. It is finished. I am Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. And I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. Water of life. This is what Jesus offered the woman at the well. But now we're at the source. The source. Jump over to chapter 22. And he showed me the water, a river, a pure river of water of life. There is crystal proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. During communion today, we talked about emptiness. And of course, we also talked about how eternity is in people's hearts. We are designed with a need for God. We are designed with the realization that eternity is real. And there's nothing in our human experience or fallen nature that can explain that horrible need much less fulfill that need. And the human condition. You walk around going, I know there's something more, but I also know there is nothing else. Because all I can imagine is right here on this world. I have no way of, of trying to seek out something better because it doesn't exist. And then somebody comes along, knocks on your door, and <laughs> intervenes and interrupts your world and asks you a couple awkward questions like, do you know where you're going to go when you die? And you go, of course I don't. What a stupid question. Why would you bother with that? I'm going to be dust. There's no way. But, you know, there's something inside of me that just cannot handle that. There's something inside the human soul because eternity is in their heart that makes them say, well, I'm not satisfied with that. There has to be more. You know, the idea that at some point your life's over and you're nothing but dust and that it doesn't matter whether you lived or died and eventually everything goes away, it's not acceptable for the average human being. Like I told that Jehovah's Witnesses, no, being stuck on this planet, in the physical body, I'm cut it for me. I'm stuck here forever. No, that's not where my home is. Our home is in heaven. This is our home right now. We are seated here right now. Verse 2, In the midst of the street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bare manner of fruits and yielded fruit every month, and the leaves of the trees were for the healing of nations. This word healing does not imply the nations are sick. This implies they are totally healthy and they're going to be kept that way and getting better and better all the time. Right? We don't need healing from sickness when we're in heaven. But, we do receive the word constantly, and we go from glory to glory. And we learn more about the kingdom of heaven, because we will spend eternity getting to know Jesus better and better 
and better. And in heaven, there's a certain category of angels that all they do is say, holy, holy, holy. And as they're saying, holy, 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 they are responding to their growth and to their understanding of God. It is not a chant. They're saying, holy, holy, holy. They're not saying, oh my gosh, I got 24 hours more of this to do. They're not on the clock. They are meditating on the current nature of God. And every few moments they go, you know, the last time I said, holy, 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 it was because I was really, really fine understanding how holy God really was, and I just couldn't help myself. I said it again. But now, you know, a few seconds have passed, and now I realize I was kind of clueless earlier on, but now I understand how holy God really is. So now I can't help myself. Holy, holy, holy. You know what? I just realized another area where God is holy. And holy, holy, holy. Oh, you know what? I thought God was holy, but it was just lip service. Now I really got it. Now I'm going to really praise the Lord. Holy, holy, holy. And this group of angels, they're designed for that. They're built for that job. And they're going to be doing that for eternity. Because there's an eternal amount of holiness to discover. An eternal amount of righteousness. An eternal amount of glory. An eternal amount of love. We will be doing the same thing. Oh, he loves me that much. Wow. Oh, he's that powerful. Oh, he created that too. All eternity. I think we can handle a few little discomforts on this world when we have the big picture. And there should be no more curse. Verse 3. And the throne of the God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. The throne of God and the Lamb. Jesus Christ is the Lamb. Jesus Christ has his own throne on the earthly kingdom. That is the whole purpose, right? And the Father spoke to the Son. He says, you, your, your throne is forever. And he will sit on that throne on the earthly kingdom in the millennial reign. That's his throne promised to him by Gabriel and all throughout the Old Testament. But when that, when that kingdom is reborn into the new heavens and new earth, now the Father and Son share the throne equally because they are equal. And they shall see his face. His name shall be in their foreheads. Okay? Character and nature of God is going to be in your brain. You're not going to be acting like it. You're not going to be trying to act like it. You're not going to be striving for it because this will be who you are. And we get the privilege of learning that now, if you want. Find out what Christ is like now. Get to learn what he is like as he heals our souls and gives us new thoughts, new minds. <clears throat> and there should be no more night there, for they need no count, neither the light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. What are we going to be doing? Two things. Serving, reigning. And they're kind of the same thing, because that is how one reigns in God's kingdom, is serving. It's going to be the absolute joy of a life. And in case you think this is too good to be true, verse 6, and he said to me, these things are faithful and true. So, some things that sound too good to be true really are true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. And so, that's really the end of the book there because at this point, the rest of the chapter you read on your own is the admonition to you and I. What is our focus? The eternal kingdom. The one that will live for, will exist forever and ever. Let's close looking in Colossians. Colossians uh, chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, if you are risen in Christ, which you are, if you've accepted Christ, if it happened to Christ, it happened to you. Did you rise from the dead? Yes, so have you. 
In other words, you now have a spiritual life. And you can reckon that life just as real as if you're in heaven right now. If you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Where is Christ right now? On the right hand of God, because he's functioning as the servant, and he's getting ready to go down and sit on his throne on the earth before they, they join at the end of that. So you're fixed on things above, not on things on the earth. You're welcome to build your own kingdom, and you'll get your reward in this life. It's your choice. And you tell me you want to do that, you want me to pray for it, fine, I'll give you a high five and I'll pray for it. You made your choice. Um, but I might take a little bit of time and try to talk you out of it. Not a lot. It's your choice. And, you know, people want to use the principles in Deuteronomy 28 to create wealth. It will work. But if you want to live by the law, don't mess up. Because read the rest of Deuteronomy 28 and 29. Because if you decide to start... Because Dale Carnegie, a very moral person, he made sure of that. He says, no, you know, I don't cheat, I don't do this, because that's going to mess up my... My, my psyche, and that's going to mess up my relationship with other employees. It was all practical business sense, and it's there. But you, you want to choose that contract with God, be my guest, because you mess up, it's all over. We've been called to a life of grace, thank God. So when I mess up, it's like, well, what did you expect? God knew it was going to happen. You get back up and keep walking. So I, we don't live in regret. We don't live in guilt. We don't live in worry because I messed up. We are free from that. But if I'm going to live in grace, I have to give up whatever secondary benefits I might think I'm getting by living by the law. And so many Christians want both worlds, and they do not fit. They do not fit. For if you are dead, verse 3, and your life is, for you are dead, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Don't try to find your life someplace else. An unsaved person can find their life in someplace else. They can find their life in their career or their hobby. They can find their life in their family. They can find their life in success. They can find their life in drugs and pornography. They can find what makes them tick. If you're not saved, if you are saved, your life is hidden with Christ. Nothing sadder than a saved Christian trying to go back to someone else to find their life because it's not there anymore. It's only in Christ. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Mortify means kill. Kill those things which are going to cause you to be attracted to the world. Things that attract you to things on this earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection. What is inordinate affection? Loving things more than God. It's fairly simple. And that can be a trap. Evil concupiscence, planning evil, covetousness, which is idolatry. Covetousness. We have a culture today that not only tells you you're supposed to covet, it praises you for coveting. Oh, you want what someone else has? Yeah, go take it. You want what someone else has? That's good. That's going to help build your dreams. No. God builds our dreams. Verse 6, for which things the sake the wrath things sake the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. You can be saved, you can know God, and you can be doing God's work, and then all of a sudden, like Balaam, you say, I'm gonna use this power, this gift that God gave me for my own sake. And out of God's incredible mercy, He's gonna stand in your way. And if you're lucky, you'll have a dumb donkey that will know better than you do keep you from that. Good news, verse 7. In all these things, you also were. So, the point is, is in the finished work, we are none of these things. And the goal is to act like it. We're not any of these things. We have a new life. We have a brand new creation. And even though all of these things apply to all of us at one time, none of them do now. So we seek the kingdom of God by seeking what Christ did for us and meditating on what Christ did for us. And what he did was he gave us a new life. And the new life seeks God. 
new life, is not interested in the things of this world anymore, except the souls. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for your clear presentation of who you are in your kingdom, your goals for humanity, your incredible love and long-suffering for us. God, if anybody listening right now that has not accepted you as their Savior, God, we just pray right now that if you haven't done that, you will pray to Jesus right now and say, Dear Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins. Thank you for accepting me into your kingdom as I am. If you prayed that prayer, you are now a child of God. You've been born into the kingdom, and you can never be unborn. So as we close out today, God, we just pray that you'd bless those that are here, those that are listening. Keep us safe, keep us healthy, and keep us focusing on your kingdom and the eternal benefits that you promised all of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I hope, hope you all enjoyed as much as I did receiving the word about the kingdom of God. Praise God. But this is the offering. And um, so if the ushers get ready to pass the baskets here and those of you at home, if you would like to participate, I'll give you the, the uh, first the online and then also the address you can send it to. So either one or the other is good. Uh, you can go online, ggwo.org forward slash donate. Then click on the Missions and Local Needs button, and then under Fund, choose Mission Specific. And then under Subfund, choose, type in, or select Owens Mills. Or you could send it to us by mail. Grace Family Fellowship, P.O. Box 1435, Owens Mills, Maryland, 21117. All right, would you all please stand? Those of you at home, you have not yet joined us, come down and join us here. Um, I always forget the address, but 11901, I believe, 11901. Huh? 11509. 509. <laughs> Thank you, Deacon. <laughs> 11509, Red Rum Boulevard, Mills. Okay? Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. For this local assembly, we thank you, Lord, that you have called us, called us with an, a holy calling, a heavenly calling. And Lord, to get to know you, to follow you, to fall in love with who you are. And, and to know these things that, Lord, you are preparing a place for us that is so far beyond what we can that our greatest imaginations are just the baseline. <laughs> That's what's amazing. Father God, we pray, dear Lord, that we will keep these things in our heart, upon it, as we run with the gospel, that we share it with as many people as we possibly can, because the door is wide open for whosoever will believe and trust in Jesus. Come, come. So we ask that you bless this time, this body. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you too.